I'm delighted to be here. My name is Claire Dillon. Um, I am a, been hanging around the Inner Source Commons for a long time now, um, but about uh, 18 months ago, I began a PhD on the topic of Inner Source. So um, I am now, I suppose, an, a researcher um, in, in, in part of, of one of the many hats that I wear. Um, but I'm delighted to be here today to share with you the, the early results from the uh, 2024 State of Inner Source report. Um, so my goal with today's presentation is to give you a little insight into the results we've got so far. And as we do the final write up of the report, I'm hoping that the questions you ask will help me include clarifying information um, and make sure that that, um, that write up and that uh, narrative around the report contains all the information that you need to make it the most useful it can be. Um, so thank you for joining me here today. Um, I suppose, in, wait, I just make sure I can progress. There we go. So just to give you a little bit of background around um, this survey and how we actually uh, plan it and manage it. First of all, uh, it's it comes from the InnerSource Commons community. And as you all probably know, uh, InnerSource Commons is the worldwide uh, community of InnerSource practitioners. We now have over 3,000 individuals who've been participating in InnerSource Commons since its inception with over 750 organizations. And in terms of the demographics of who, who responded to this survey, um, I think it's important to note that uh, we did have 119 respondents, but they are mostly from the Inner Source Commons community. Now, it does go broader than that, um, but it's worthwhile keeping in mind that many of the responses to this survey um, are from folks who participate in the Commons, uh, which means that to some degree, they know a little bit more about Inner Source perhaps than, than perhaps the market may. So it's wor worthwhile keeping that in mind. Um, that, that that we all come, that a lot of the actual respondents came from the Inner Source Commons community. Naturally speaking, um, I say this because it's to be expected, most of the respondents were male, though actually um, that's a reducing amount. So we had 30% uh, of the respondents and not identify as being male, um, which I think for our industry is actually, relatively speaking, pretty high. Um, but we did see that a lot of the folks that responded did have over 10 years experience. So a lot of folks that are experienced in their field, very big spread in terms of the roles from developers to project managers, advocates and executives. Um, we had a wide range of sectors respond. 50% of them were from the technology industry, but 15 plus uh, sectors were actually identified. So even longer than the list that we gave as options, we had more people add in uh, different vertical specific industries uh, in the other category. So what we're seeing actually is a growth in terms of last year, that was only 10 sectors. So we're seeing a growth in terms of the number of sectors where, uh, where inner source has starting to being adopted, certainly from this survey's result. Uh, it's very much spread across all org sizes, but it is weighted towards large companies of more than 10,000 employees. And we had responses from over 13 countries, um, with the largest number of responses coming from the US and uh, Germany, actually uh, being very, very strong from a European perspective. Regionally, if you look at it, uh, Europe was actually top from a from a um uh, geographical perspective, then coming the Americas and then Asia and Australia coming coming as well. Um, I will say that uh, in terms of uh, the responses, it's worthwhile noting that there is a potential for multiple responses to come from each organization. But this year we did not notice any kind of um, uh, grouping together of any particular organization. Uh, the ability to add your organization was optional. So of course, it may be the case that some, there is some repeat um, responses in there. But uh, from what we could see, there was no obvious, uh, I suppose, clumping together or multiple responses from any one of the organizations. We did have some changes in terms of the survey. Now it's worthwhile noting, I didn't put this in here, but it's worthwhile noting that this survey work uh, was started a number of years ago by a researcher that's also based here in Ireland uh, by the name of Klaus Jan Stahl, another member of, of the association. And that was built upon by Tapishit Day, Day, sorry, Tapishit Day, a, a number of years ago. And, uh, and, and, and the survey itself has been evolving uh, through the input of the Inner Source Commons community. So um, each year we do 
uh, make this available. The process is open uh, within the community. If you are interested, you can join us on the survey channel if you want to be involved in next year's survey. But through that mechanism and through uh, consultation in some of our events, we actually uh, work with the community to find out which questions are most useful, but also to, to look at that design of the survey and see how we could improve it. So there were some changes made from last year. First of all, we wanted to make sure there was some feedback that the survey was too long. So we wanted to make sure that each of the parts were relevant to people. So this year, we actually created pathways by context of the individual responding, whether or not they were an individual who was practicing inner source, whether or not they had information about their organizational approach to inner source um, and some information that was relevant in terms of feedback to the inner source comments itself. What that meant was that I think we gave perhaps a little bit more of a focused approach um, to the respondents who were responding. But the unintended consequence is that we did have less responses for each uh, set of questions. So it's worthwhile noting that in terms of our survey design, I think we we delivered in terms of perhaps making it a little bit more focused, but it did have an impact in terms of the results that we actually gathered in the end. We did remove some questions that were deemed to be perhaps either too long or complicated to answer or were considered less valuable from the folks who participated in that survey design. But we did add, add, add some new questions. In particular, uh, one of the areas that I was particularly interested in as a researcher were what types of projects uh, inner source is being practiced on. And is there, is there a typical uh, type of project that would make InnerSource more successful within the organization? So we did add one question about the project type. And for me, that was a really interesting addition to this year's survey. We do also, we did include some new options. Um, from last year's survey, we, we included the ability to add in, um, in your own words or other categories that we may not have actually included from the historical questions that we had, which were in the very beginning based off the inner source checklist um, and, and have evolved over time. So we wanted to make sure that the options we were giving people were relevant as the practice of inner source evolves. So we ad added the option for people to put in other categories in some of these areas and we included um, anything from that in this year's survey as an option. And we also had an interesting uh, addition this year about asking people to describe inner source in their own words um, because there is there are various different efforts going on throughout the comments in terms of defining or getting more definition about the term inner source so we wanted to add to that discussion so um, uh, I haven't included all those answers but I will reference those as we go through. Um, and of course, we did have the potential for members. So I just want to say thanks to everyone who gave feedback um, in terms of the survey design. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. So the first thing I'm going to cover is what, what people think of when they think of inner source. Um, and I think for me, the interesting thing about this year's results was that code reuse popped up to the top. So again, in a change from last year, last year, I believe the adopting open source practices was top of the heap when people were thinking about what, what they think of for inner source. But it, throughout the questions this year, you'll see code reuse emerging as a, a very important theme in terms of, I suppose, why people are thinking about inner source uh, to begin with. Naturally speaking, adopting open practices comes in there every year as a very high percentage, um, enabling collaboration, and very importantly, connection and learning, which is something that, personally speaking, I think perhaps doesn't necessarily get the attention it deserves when we talk about the benefits of inner source. Because time and time again, we're seeing it as one of the top reasons that people um, talk about either adopting inner source or certainly their motivations or the benefits they get from inner source. So I just want to call out this idea of um, this connection and learning as being a very, very important part of why inner source is so useful. And perhaps that's even more important in today's complex world where we're looking for new and better ways to actually keep our skills up. Uh, so then looking at the status of, of where inner source is at in certain organizations, uh, the first thing we looked at is people's experience with inner source, the origins of inner source within their company, the support and the resources and programs available. So in the survey respondents, we had 24% of them were, I suppose, maybe what we call early stage inner source practitioners with one or two, three years of inner source experience um, and 42% at three plus years. So um, we're actually seeing a slight increase in terms of the number of people in that early stage. Um, in terms of inner source origins, we had 
the majority of people are mixed so that they're reporting that that inner source is coming in both from bottom up and a top down mandate in terms of this being a good idea um but we are seeing if you had to choose one or the other there's slightly more in terms of bottom up um, grassroots approach versus uh, top down uh, mandates i suppose for inner source to be adopted within the organization 44% of people report that InnerSource is considered an important strategy in their company, and 58% of executive management support, which is uh, um, not as high as we would like, but uh, but good to see that there is a, a significant uh, percentage of people reporting that they do have management buy-in. In terms of the dedicated resources to InnerSource, 49% or nearly half of the, organize, or the respondents, should I say, have dedicated InnerSource resources in their organization. Uh, 31% of informal uh, inner source programs, a quarter of them have formal uh, inner source programs or ISPOs. So we are seeing that this idea of formalizing the enablement of inner source uh, overall, I think, is, is, is a trend that we're seeing within the respondents to the survey. And in terms of whether or not what the trajectory of inner source is in within their organization, uh, whether or not it's like increasing or decreasing or just sustaining at, at a steady rate, uh, we do for this particular question, we did have a large number of folks who opted out of declaring either way. So that could be because they either don't know or because there is some uh, for example, one of the other responses was that in some parts of the organization, it's it's scaling up in some parts of the organization staying steady and some parts it's, it may be actually um, not being as successful. So this is a very contextual answer, I think. Uh, but we do have nearly half of the respondents saying that they're still scaling up their inner source efforts throughout the organization. When we look at the benefits that are reported around inner source, um, Again, this year, for the first time, reusable software has popped up to the top of the list. Now, that's not to say that removing silos, knowledge sharing, efficiencies like speed are not still important, as you can see from this particular list. But I do think it's really interesting to see that code reuse, uh, which wasn't before on the top of this list, is now at the top of this list. So um, that, for me, is an interesting uh, change in terms of the order that that we have these motivations in terms of why organizations have, have, have started with InnerSource to begin with. And when you ask them, uh, what have you seen progress in? Well, then the top of the list again becomes code reuse. So uh, so this is, now we've noted in the past that uh, oftentimes the, the top motivations are the ones that people report seeing progress in. Um, so that's interesting. This year, it's not quite in the same order as you can see here. Um, for example, removing silos and bottlenecks is a top motivation, uh, but that flips with knowledge sharing in terms of the reported progress. Some of that may be down to the difficulty in actually measuring progress in some of these areas. Um, but I think it is interesting uh, for, for us to observe the fact that, again, code reuse has, has pulled up to the very top of, of this uh, area in terms of progress that we see. Um, and removing silos and bottlenecks and knowledge sharing with the other two areas that folks have seen progress. Um, we did ask this year for people to comment on how they're measuring, and this has been a common question, because if we're asking for measurable progress, one, one would assume that there are some measures around that. Um, and uh, this was an open question in terms of people being able to describe what they do. There were not as many answers to this area, which I think um, illustrates the fact that and this would, from anecdotal feedback, we know that there are a lot of organizations who are practicing inner source who have not put any measures in place to date, and that may be because they're just starting, or they may feel that actually that is, doesn't necessarily help um, the practice in the way that you think it might. Certainly in the early stage um, implementations, we have heard reports that it's sometimes better to let things um, evolve a little bit before you actually put rigid measures in place. However, when we do ask how people are measuring their inner source progress, um, the three ways that have come out in terms of how folks are measuring this are tools. So people who have created dashboards or measurements around, for example, measuring the number of inner source projects, sometimes to do with just checking to see if there's a contribution.md file or a readme or that they have um, flagged their project as an inner source project sometimes in terms of actually measuring the number of outside contributions to a project, and also, uh, which I think is borne out in terms of our measurable progress um, uh, results on the last question, 
whether or not the inner source project is being reused, that they would be the three areas that were commented on in terms of the tools measurement that is put in, put in place. But quite a lot of the um, other, well, to, to the degree where there weren't that many answers, but some people are only actually observing um, uh, inner source success by observation, looking at how and getting feedback, anecdotal feedback from their teams about how they feel inner source is going. And some people are running surveys to check in on motivation, motivation, motivations, blockers, awareness around inner source. Um, and my understanding is that some people have actually used some of the questions that we use in this survey, but done it internally. Um, so so that's that's how they did it. One person did actually say that they manually count the number of uh, inner source projects and the pull requests that are coming from external to the organization. So I can only assume that they're they're not yet in the huge scaling phase, but, uh, but, but, but fair dues to the folks that are actually counting out uh, manually uh, the number of projects that are involved in inner source. Um, in terms of the inner source benefits, the personal benefits, and I think this is really interesting because what what I what what is what is obvious to me is that sometimes the organizational benefits and the personal benefits, the individual motivation for practicing inner source may actually be different. And it's worthwhile noting that that both of these things, I think, exist. And um, and perhaps we need to also think in inner source commons, as we describe the value of inner source, we may need to actually break out the idea of the value to the organization and the value to the individual. Because for individuals, um, the top uh, benefit of inner source, and this has been the case, I believe, for a number of years, has been sharing knowledge. So it is around this idea of learning. Um, and connecting with people, getting to know more people within my organization, and then to improve my skills and the quality of the software I work in. Things like enjoyment and excitement turn up in the top five reasons. So for those reasons, I think it's really, really important for us to, um, to consider these individual motivations for practicing inner source. Uh, because again, I'm not sure any tooling is going to be able to measure things like enjoyment and excitement. And certainly the tooling is currently not at all focused on sharing knowledge, but these are the benefits that people are reporting. So um, perhaps that's something we, should, we need to consider as, as a community. And of course, satisfaction, sorry, I missed my build there. And now next is the blockers. The blockers always fascinates me. But why isn't it working? Or why are people perceiving that inner source may not be working or not scaling as much as it might? Here is what they say. Uh, first of all, uh, the culture, the organization culture or silo thinking, that has crept up to the top of the list. That was not on the top of the list last year, but is now. Um, and I believe actually that may be a new entry on the list based on the feedback we had from last year. But every year the idea of not having enough time to contribute and this being expressed not not as i don't have enough time it's more about as being a prioritization against the many many other things that a group is being asked to do so sometimes inner source falls off the bottom of the list um, and this will become relevant when we see about other areas that are actually blocking the success of inner source because if you look at the, we also asked people to describe in their own words, what might be blocking people. And the time and resource constraints came up quite a lot. But what was interesting to me was that quite often people were, were specifically talking about the, the readiness of the projects that they may want to contribute to. And that the most often thing that was cited was the documentation. So I'm, I'm blocked from doing inner source because um, the documentation isn't there to help me do it. They also mentioned the fact that they can't find the project. So findability would be an issue as well. And in my mind, when we think about the time and resource constraints, if that's impacting a team's ability to do the correct documentation, to make the effort to make, you know, to put in the effort to make their actual project findable across an organization, we can start seeing that that has a, a I suppose, a, a compounding effect around the ability for the organization to practice inner source at all. Um, so this idea of the time and resources that it does take to set a baseline for inner source effectiveness, um, I think is something that is worthwhile for us to perhaps discuss again as a community. Um, other top areas of, of blockers are 
general awareness about inner source or an understanding about what it really means. Um, and as always, lack of management buy-in, either from an executive management or indeed middle management. If you take those together, um, it, 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 it always comes up as a theme. Um, and one, certainly through our anecdotal feedback, we would know that that relates to the time and, and prioritization and uh, resourcing discussions as well, because if obviously if there's not executive buy-in, if there's not middle management buy-in, um, then sometimes it's very hard to carve out the necessary time to do this. Then we asked what practices that they are currently engaging in with regard to inner source. And uh, you can see here the order and the rank in which um, the, the various different practices have been listed. Um, the vast majority of folks who are practicing inner source and they're thinking about the projects that they work on, um, the code is st st stored in a version control repository. Um, the code does have contributions from outside the team. It is being reused by other teams. It is well documented. Well, just over half is 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 sufficiently well documented. Um, so one would hopefully think that that might be higher. Um, again, to 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 encourage inner source um contributions. Findability it comes into this uh this list as well as the idea of having dedicated trusted committers, which um I think is 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 a great thing to see. Um, and then the idea of code quality or how easy it is to contribute to the code. Is the code sufficiently modular for, for people to be able to make changes easily and safely? That does factor in the list of the practices that people report upon. What was interesting to me as well is that uh, we, we did have this line at the bottom about 20% um, of people responded that their project code may be visible, but it is not the project is not accepting inbound contributions. And the reason why I wanted to call that out is because um, of a discussion around the definition of inner source and how it relates to the definition of open source um, that was that was live in the in the community in the last few months. Um, so I think it's an interesting one for us to consider. I know that in in my early days in inner source commons, there was a presumption that inner source code is open to code contributions from outside the team. In fact, many people sometimes define success by that measure. Um, however, it is worth noting that within organizations, and in particular in the context of a primary motivation being code reuse, that sometimes that code is made available for reuse, but is not accepting inbound contributions. So something for us all to discuss as being uh, perhaps uh, uh, a kind of a context of inner source that perhaps doesn't get as much attention. Then when we ask about which of the practices apply to the team, um, you can see here that the ranking in terms of the, the popularity of practices within a team, um, top of the list is team members responding to bugs, uh, willing to do code reviews, participation in internal forums, create and maintain documentation. We're moving down now into the 50s in terms of how many people and people on their team actually practice this. Um, people feeling comfortable about others seeing their code, um, engaging in mentoring practices, and then under half of people um, would have participated in open source projects or are willing to have difficult conversations. Who likes having difficult conversations? But but under under half of the inner source practitioners um, are are willing to have those state that they're willing to have those uh, difficult conversations. Um, I was quite surprised about the the low ranking of uh, things like an archival mechanism for discussions, um, because knowing that that idea of the documenting of changes in inner source projects has been reported as such a, a benefit to those who do it, uh, but that comes in relatively low in terms of team practices. Um, and the idea that that people are are open to receiving less than perfect code, uh, we all love perfection, um, but that that can be a, a lower uh, practice on on the list. Um, and this idea again that team members are actually actively modularizing code in order to enable inner source, and I think this may actually be linked to the time and resource constraint blocker that we saw earlier in the data. This was the new um, question that we had this year for the first time, which was looking at the types of projects that are um, described as or that that are that come up as inner source projects within their organization. And I think what was really interesting for me um, was that um, whoops, sorry, was that the the top project types that were described are all ones that 
primarily are designed for reuse. I mean, if you're building a, a, a library for common use or internal tools, or if you're building a DevOps platform or a platform project, um, all of these things are fundamentally most successful if they are reused. Um, so they're not necessarily being built to scratch your own itch. I mean, they may be, but they're often being built to scratch everyone's itch. Um, and so what's clear from this is that those are the projects where people find inner source, you know, more often, which is not surprising, I think. Um, what was surprising to me is the area of documents as code. So um, so what, we're, what we may be seeing there is that inner source does appeal uh, for this, this particular scenario of, of collaborating around documents. Um, and I thought that was really interesting in the broader context of us talking about spreading open source knowledge throughout an organization, because certainly from my personal experience, um, having been uh, a, an, an inner source and open source contributor in the context of documentation, not code, um, I think that's a really uh, interesting scenario again for us to, to consider as a community when we think about the inner source, the, the, the profile of inner source practitioners. Um, then there are a number of projects in there that are explicitly cross organizational boundaries, whether they may be divisional boundaries or even cross uh, national boundaries within the context of one organization or even across multiple organizations um, in the context of coming together to create club goods uh, where you may actually have, for example, an external uh, um, an external uh, supplier working on a project within internally to the company. Um, so I think this is a really interesting addition to the survey for me. Um, it really does both reinforce some of the anecdotal evidence that we've had before, um, but also, uh, as I said, brings up some new interesting areas for discussion around the documents as code. So that's my my whistle stop tour of of the early set of results. Um, you're seeing some of the 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 tables that will be included in the final report, um, and a little bit of my commentary. I suppose you you'll have heard from here. But what I'm really interested to do now in our discussion area is to find out more of your questions, uh, so we can add to that narrative to help make this as useful as possible for the community. So thank you very much. Oh, and I should say, whoops, before, before I finish, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to all, to everyone who's asked, was involved in the creation, the promotion and the analysis of the survey. Um, I, I'm here presenting the results, but I do want to say that this is um, this is a, is a community effort. And uh, there were a, a, a large number of people who were involved in the design of the survey and indeed promotion of the survey, including uh, folks like Olive and um, other members of, the, of, and everyone in the community who helped us push it out both externally on social media, but also internally in their company. So really big thank you to them and to University of Galway who provided us with the Qualtrics platform to allow us to, to run the survey as well. Um, uh, and yes, for the benefit of the online audience, uh, don't forget to come and join us in innersourcecommons.org or feel free to reach out to me um, at uh, either on LinkedIn or at this email address. <laughs>